great. All right. Hey, Bonnie. Hi, Alexi. Hey, Michael. Great to see everyone. Notice that there is a chat window and a Q&A window, so I'll take a look at those as we go through the session. We're recording right now. So hello, everyone. And we are going to start this fourth data literacy webinar of 2019. I'm actually really excited about this one. You know, this one comes from a, a conversation I had with a good friend of mine that some of you may know, Michael Mixon. Michael lives down in Gig Harbor, uh, not too far from here in the Seattle area. And um, the conversation uh, included the phrase, exploring the contours of your data. And he said that phrase, and it was a number of years ago now, maybe three years ago, I think. And it has stuck with me ever since. And I think it's a really important step in the overall data working process that, you know, analysts need to use clearly. And I also believe that people who are data literate um, would do well to understand exactly what this means. And I want to look at some examples. And I've broken down what I think are 10 helpful questions for you as you look to explore the contours of your data. So we'll talk about what that means. We'll go through those steps one by one. And then when we're done, we can have some Q&A, okay? If we have enough time at the end. Uh, before we start, are there any comments or questions? Can you all see my screen okay, I hope? Great, okay, thanks everyone. Okay, cool, so let's dive into it since there's a lot to cover in an hour. So first of all, as I like to uh, do, you know, I just want to thank everyone for joining. So. What this is all about is this is a mission to help people learn the language of data. It's such an important skill in our world to be able to read, um, understand, create and communicate data as information to other people. And I believe a big part of that is being able to get our hands on data ourselves and being able to see what's there and maybe what's not there. So thanks for joining live. I uh, definitely encourage you as we send out the recording afterward to send it around to people that you think might benefit from it. And again, you know, the primary audience for this one, I noticed just from the, hey, Michael is on. Great. I'm glad that you joined, Michael. Michael Mixon has joined the, the uh, live session here. Uh, so again, I owe um, this entire really um, webinar and the concept around it to, uh, to a good friend of mine, Mike. So, so yeah, um, you know, the, the intended audience here, even though a number of you who are joining are already very experienced data analysts which is great. I think that this is a good reminder. But the intent here is for me to reach out to people who are data phobic and really help them get a better handle on what it means to build their own data literacy skills. And not just skills, but also attitudes and behaviors that go along with that. So thanks again for joining. Um, you know, we started this, the first of the four was all about the 17 key traits of data literacy and really attempting to put my uh, my mind around all of those different traits that involve, are involved in becoming highly data literate. And then we moved on in the second to talk about this flow that you can take as you seek to build a framework to work with data yourself. And it's the wisdom flow. So it really involves going from, you know, wondering about something in the world. And we'll do this a few times. We'll sort of walk through a few of the steps. But uh, it, it takes you all the way through you know, seeking for data that is going to be relevant to that question or observation. And then eventually being able to discover what's there, you know, and finding that story that you can then go on and mature and help others mature by telling data stories as well as making key decisions. So this was the second uh, of, the, of the four. And then, uh, and you can see, you know, we went into great detail here. And then the third is this, this tiny little section in the bottom left, which is so important. It's at the very beginning, as you can see it's on the left in this first sort of column of steps we take when we work with data. And it's all about, you know, how do you find relevant data? How do you actually go and gather it? Or maybe even, if necessary, you know, create it yourself. And so this was the third webinar, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, finding and gathering relevant data. Okay, so that leads us from those steps, once you do have that data in your hands, a very early step. So, you know, the tendency, I think, is for us to, once we have data, just start to dive in and figure out what's there, right? Like, that's the first thing. We're just going to go ahead and ask and answer questions right there on the spot. But that can be tricky. It can lead us to some problems, perhaps. So I feel like up front, there's this really important step we can take, which is to kind of take a look at what's there. It's essentially... Uh, taking stock of what is this data set that you have on your hands. What does it include? What does it not include? What are the boundaries of it? How is it broken down? 
And so um, this is this, uh, this concept of exploring the contours of your data, again, which I owe to, to Michael. Uh, and thank you again for joining Michael. So this is a graphic. So we had this crazy snowstorm here in Seattle. I know people in the Midwest, in Toronto and Minneapolis, you all are laughing at us for talking about having a crazy snowstorm. But uh, nevertheless, for Seattle standards, it certainly was. And so my son sat right here in the office with me and helped me with some Photoshop and put together this graphic because I asked him, to, you know, he's a, a 10th grader here at Newport High School in the Seattle area on the east side, uh, close to Bellevue and Redmond and that, that area. But I asked him to kind of, you know, give me an idea of, of this notion of sort of traveling around the boundaries of something. And so this is what he came up with. And I started a couple of weeks ago with, you know, this the idea of what is a contour anyway, and how does that apply to data sets? And um, so, you know, a contour is usually sort of an outline, right? A boundary or a borderline, okay? It could be a natural one like a hill. It could be a, you know, one that we create perhaps like a fence or a border on a country. But a contour is the outside edge. Um, and, and it also, in the second definition there at the bottom, gives us a sense for the way in which something varies. So it could be pitch of music or pattern of notes, right? So this idea that there's contours to the things that we uh, are working with, like texture on a table maybe, or you know, the fluctuations of my voice, highs and lows. Um, and those are also part of the contours. So not just the edges around, but also inside and, and what the texture within looks like. And, and I want to apply this concept to data. But before we do, I want to think about contours in this, the context of a world map. So you know what's funny is, um, oftentimes, you can find world maps. We see world maps, right? Uh, they're all around us, uh, online, on the walls, you name it. There's world maps on our t-shirts even, um, world maps, okay? And so, do you know one thing that's common about all of these world maps, and in fact, many, many others, if you look at the contours, the edges of the map itself, it's actually missing something, um, missing something kind of, to some people, really, really important. Does anybody know what it is? What are all of these maps missing? There's one thing, if you think about the edges, if you think about the ex exterior or like, yeah, it's, it's thank you, Michael, it's, it's missing New Zealand. It's missing New Zealand. Take a look at every one of them. Do you see New Zealand down there in the bottom right-hand corner? Oftentimes, poor New Zealand, you know, it gets left off. Um, and so this is actually a website called World Maps Without New Zealand. It's a Tumblr site. You can go to it right there or worldmapswithoutnewzealand.tumblr.com and you can go and look and see. So often with visualization, you know, we leave out uh, on the contours, it's good to pay attention to those borders and boundaries and see did outliers get left out, not calling the entire country of New Zealand outliers, although maybe perhaps they would, they would think they are, certainly geographically. However, only as you lay out a certain perspective of the world map, right? If you were to shift that center point, um, then that would change things quite a bit. But world maps without New Zealand. So in honor of New Zealand, you know, and to really kind of, uh, as a way of, you know, as I live in America, and, you know, apologizing to the country of New Zealand for leaving them off so many world maps. I want to start with the story of New Zealand itself. Now, I've never been there. I would love to go. It is way up at the top of my list of places I'd like to visit in the near future. So if you know anyone from New Zealand, put them in touch with me. I'd like to get out there soon. But I want to start with New There it is. So we're going to, we're going to devote the entire, almost the entire slide right here just to New Zealand. So that's it with a little bit of my contours, like my son drew, you know, of the, the outline of, of essentially what's two islands of, uh, of New Zealand, right? The North and the South Island. Now, this is actually really important to note because, as we've talked about in previous webinars, um, in 1642, this was the first time that a European sailed upon or discovered or even noticed the, uh, the island of New Zealand. And his name was Abel Tasman. I assume that is where Tasmania comes from. But um, again, the first European to discover New Zealand. Now, he mistakenly thought these two islands were connected, that they were the same. Okay, And so he named this area right here in the middle uh, after his ship, Zehane's Bight. So what's a bite? I didn't actually know this, but a bite, and this is actually where I grew up right here. This is an example of a bite right here in Southern California. Uh, in the area. I grew up right around here, I guess, in Ventura County area. But from Point Concepcion here all the way down to San Diego is, is this kind of bite where it's just, it kind of looks like a bite taken out of a cracker or something maybe. It's essentially a curved coastline between, between two places. And so this is what Tasman thought this middle area was. So in other words, he didn't do a very good job of exploring those contours, did he? So about 100, over 100 years later, uh, famous uh, discoverer and um, Navigator James Cook, captain of, of a number of ships, 
were sailing uh, the Pacific and, and all around that region. So over 100 years later, James Cook is the first European to know, notice what he did. He completely circumnavigated what he discovered to be a pair of islands to make up the native home of the Maori people. I was just showing my boys the haka dance last night. I can't remember why that came up, but we were looking at that on YouTube. Fascinating uh, kind of story there. And actually, they have a story for this middle area, this waterway or this passage between the two islands that you can look up. But he correctly noticed, obviously, because he did a more thorough job here of exploring the contours of these islands, that there is an actually navigable, pa navigable passage between these two islands and that these two land masses aren't actually connected at all. And now we know this area is Cook Strait. And so it's not called Zehane's Bight. It isn't even a bite. It's, it's a strait, and we know what a strait is. But you can see if you zoom in on it, right? There it is, Cook Strait, a little waterway. And, and you can see why maybe they made that mistake. You know, it sort of overlaps a little bit. And maybe if you just sort of sailed by it or just, you know, kind of barely went in it, you wouldn't have done a uh, – you, you perhaps wouldn't have, have noticed it. And, and that's a, a – uh, an object lesson for us, I think, for as we work with data that, you know, there is a level of, of, of thoroughness, I guess, that you can apply to examining the limits and the boundaries of a data set that's going to help you find these little missing nuggets here that will cause you to come to a better understanding of what it is that you're working with. So that's kind of the, the, the idea, okay, is that we're trying to take a data set just like James Cook took New Zealand, explore its contours in a thorough fashion, find all the nooks and crannies. Notice where things maybe might not be what we think they are, okay, what they might appear to be uh, at, at, the, at first. And that's the idea of exploring the contours and why I have really just loved this idea and have used it so much over the years as I've worked with data myself. So I've came up with 10 questions that, and, and you know, I think there are more. I don't think that by any means this is exhaustive. As with most things I do, it's a starting point for me. Um, and so I'd like to share it with you because I thought to myself, you know, if I can help other people go through some of these questions in a way that helps them maybe um, notice some things they would not have otherwise noticed, then I think that that'll be helpful to everyone. So I wanna walk through these um, one at a time. And so uh, the first one is really kind of starting at the lowest level of texture, right? Which is sort of how granular is this data? And, and the question to ask is, what does a single row mean? And so for example, you know, uh, I mentioned the snow Mageddon here in Seattle, this is only, a few weeks ago, it's funny, it's all melted now, but, but this was a scene, you know, only a few weeks ago right here in town, people actually skiing and snowboarding right down the streets of Seattle. Um, and so uh, I actually was kind of interested, you know, I didn't really have anywhere to go. And so I was, uh, you know, curious if I could find data about the snow and snowfall in the area, you know. So again, it starts with an observation. And again, I want to underscore this before we go a little further. And that is that, you know, data isn't just this abstract thing that we want to think about, right? It's actually just nothing more than a lens to see our world. So this was the world that I was presented with a few months, a few weeks ago. Okay. And the question I had was, well, is this abnormal to see this much snow? And so the lens uh, for me to be able to answer that question came from the National Weather Service right here, actually in town. And as part of the uh, NOAA Department of the Federal Government of the United States provides snowfall data uh, for a variety of places. And so you can just go download that. I put the link right there if you're interested in finding it. This is what it looked like, right? And so you can see there, um, then I was able to just convert this over here to a spreadsheet in Google Sheets just by, uh, by essentially copying and pasting it out of there, or I think I was actually exporting it. But if I ask myself, what is a row here? Uh, what is a record, right, a row? Well, in this case, a row is a season. And it's, it straddles, you can notice, from July through June of the following calendar year. And so a single row here is a season. And, and you can notice also that what is included in the data, if I just scan across one row, is a certain number of inches of snowfall. And um, so then that's aggregated as well, right? Because they don't actually, um, the way it works as I understand it, I was exchanging emails with some really friendly folks at NOAA, just inquiring about this data set. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but uh, they add up, you know, every single day, there's a cumulative snowfall total. So it isn't necessarily that that amount there is another metric you can look at here, by the way, which is like the total depth of the snow at any given time. But for the purposes of what a monthly total is, it's a sum, it's an aggregation. So that number every single day is added to the previous day of that same month. And then when you're done with the month, you get a single number. And then that's tabulated in this essentially aggregated cross tab of the file that you can go get. So in that sense, like that's the structure of the data. That's the format of it. And that's what a row means. That's what a single row means. But that's very different than another kind of data set that we're going to look at, 
And this is relative to people that live in Seattle, like me, know that this has been, we call it Crane City. So we have had, I think, the largest population growth of any of the large United States cities in the past few years. And that is reflected in the number of cranes you see all around town. So uh, there's actually a data set as well that you can go get on data.seattle.gov that shows all the building permits going back for years. And so a row here is quite a bit different, right? It isn't any more like an aggregated type of a scenario where, for example, you might be counting the number of permits. And that's not what they provide. Okay, what they're providing on the City of Seattle Open Data Portal is literally a list of every single permit number that they have been able to record and, and save for us and publish to the web. So it's and then a list of records, right? And you can see each one has its own number and what type it is and what, uh, whether, you know, a full description of that, uh, if you'd like, and then the date that it was applied for and a variety of other uh, variables about it. But just coming to grips with what a single row is, I think is super valuable. Kind of before you go into asking and answering any questions of that data, it really helps to just crack it open. Now, when I say that, you know, I can actually do it a few ways. You can, if it's a file, you can open it, you know, and you can, um, do that kind of a thing. If it's here online in a portal, you can look to view the data. And so um, I recommend doing that. You know, before you actually start to analyze it, before you start to create charts and graphs or anything like that, I like to just see it in its granularity and try to figure out what a row looks like, okay? Um, so that's granularity. And then, you know, oftentimes we want to come to an idea pretty early on. Uh, how, what's, the, what's the overall size of this thing? What are the total number of records that I'm working with here? And, you know, sort of back to the, the analogy of, of New Zealand, we might ask ourselves, well, how big is the country in square miles or perhaps how many people live there? Some basic question like that and do some comparisons. You can see what New Zealand looks like over uh, laid on top of Europe or you can see going all the way from the south of France up into Denmark. You can see what it looks like superimposed on top of um, the uh, east coast of the United States going all the way from the top of Florida right on up there to uh to Lake Erie. So, you know, getting a sense of the overall size of a thing. Once we get to the, so this is kind of the opposite of granularity, right? So the granularity kind of tells us what every single record is, what ro a row means in that data set. And then we go to the opposite end of the extreme and say, okay, now how big is it? So in the case of, for example, um, this data set we were dealing with building permits, um, I could just simply, if I were looking at it in Excel, which, you know, we often do. I mean, you know, Excel is a very popular data working tool. Um, it has its own challenges and so forth. But what we could do very simply is just start in A1 and hit Control uh, Shift down or Command Shift down in the case of uh, a Mac. And you will go all the way uh, you know, down to uh, the bottom of the table. Now, you need to be a little careful when you do things like that. And let me just kind of bounce out of, uh, of PowerPoint here just to show you what I mean. So if we talk about, uh, here it is. This is the data set right here. Now, one thing to be careful about and you can see control shift up does the same. So if I start here in the A1 in the left and I say, I'm gonna know how many rows there are in this data set. You know, is it is it 100 permits? Is it 100,000 permits? How, do, how many are there? If you hit command shift down, you can see it goes all the way down. Now, it doesn't necessarily go to the bottom. It just goes to the next place where it finds a blank. In this case, in row one, in column one rather, I'm lucky in that every single, uh, there's no there are no nulls. We'll talk more about nulls in a minute, but. Uh, all of column one is one single list of values in permit numbers that goes all the way to the bottom. And you can see I'm dealing with 12, 124,887 because uh, row one would be the column headers, but I've got uh, almost uh, 125,000 uh, different permits in this data set. Okay, so that's what I'm dealing with now. I get a sense now of the size and scope of this data set, over 100,000 uh, permit applications for Seattle. So that's one way to do it. Now, we don't always have um, the ability to look at data in Excel like this, right? So another way to do this would be if you are familiar with R and R Studio. Okay, so I can come in, into your R Studio, and this is in a PowerPoint slide where I'm just essentially importing that data into into uh, R Studio, right? Which is a free environment to be able to analyze data. And instead of doing this in PowerPoint, you know, we can come in here. And again, I was just doing, you can actually just import it over here using the RStudio GUI, or if you want, after you load the ReadR library, or I've already done it in this uh, workshop here, but if I uh, load the um, Tidyverse, for example, 
it's going to be able to install, uh, it's already loaded here, but I can you know, read the CSV, which I've saved to my working directory called building permits. Okay, and I can read that in to my workbook. And then I think it's already in there, so I'll just go view. And then I can actually go ahead and you know, kind of get a sense for what is involved here. Uh, actually, no, sorry, this one, the read CSV, I needed to actually put the quotes around it, so let's do this. So I can view it up here as a table, okay? But if I wanted to import it for the first time, and you may not have ever worked with R before, or if you have, you know how this works, but um, you know, I have this CSV file saved to a folder on my computer that RStudio is pointing to, so I can just read it in there. And then when it comes in here, I get this nice little uh, description, right, of what it has. And I love how they do this because it tells me right away. In fact, it doesn't just tell me in one place. I was going through and saying, how many places does it tell me? How many records there are? And there's actually one up here in the top right when you import it, okay? There's one over here where you see the table. If you view the table, it tells you it's showing one to 10 of 124,000. There it is, 887 entries. It's again right here when I read it in and, and import it. And it's even down here uh, after I show the top 10 uh, rows, it then tells me I've got another 124,877. So there's four places where our studio is giving me a good idea of exactly how many records are involved. And it's an important step, right? Because you get a sense again of like, what does this thing contain? How many things are there? And that's a really important step. Columns is, is similar, but you know, instead of looking at the rows and the number of records, we're taking a look at the number of variables. In this case, the building permits has 24 variables. So uh, those can be of a different type, but I can see it here one time, two times, and three times. It says 17 because I already see seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here in the, the display. And it's telling me there's 17 more. So, you know, seven plus 17 gives me that 24 variable uh, count, which is basically the number of columns you can see as you look across it. So again, you know, how many variables are there? Are we dealing with, you know, just a few variables with each permit? Are we dealing with hundreds of variables about each permit application? Or, or in this case, we're dealing with a couple dozen. So again, that gives us a sense of, okay, I, gotta, I now have a handle on, you know, how many attributes and um, uh, sort of characteristics of each one of these. I know what a record is, and I know how many attributes it has. And so that gives me a sense, again, of like just orienting myself. And think about it like, again, you're going around the contour of an island, just kind of saying, like, you know, how, what, what is this thing? And, you know, I'm just going to kind of circle it real quick and see what's there. That's the idea. Let's keep moving along. So actually, this is what the data set itself looks like if you look at it on the portal itself. So I did that. Actually, I can pull it over here from my other screen. I, I love that about this Soprata um, database here that Seattle has set up that I can go to this building permits uh, file right here, okay? And I can um, just kind of get some metadata about it. It's telling me when it was updated last, telling me how many people have viewed it and downloaded it, so giving me a sense of usage. And then it, again, you know, what's in the data set? There we go, right? It tells me both the number of rows and number of columns right there, a nice big bold number. So these platforms are making it easy as possible for us to get a sense of, of what it is. Now, if I had done this and let's say I come into the next day and I do the similar analysis and this is more like, you know, something like 100 records, I would know something's changed about the data set. And sometimes that happens. Uh, perhaps there's an error in, in updating or perhaps someone's done something and, and broken it into pieces. So, you know, again, you kind of like are like, whoa, time out. Before I go any further and start to ask questions of this data set, something maybe has changed in the overall size and scope of what it is that we're dealing with. All right, this next one is kind of a fun one and it's really about the type of data. So, you know, not all um, data types and variables are the same, right? So what are they? And so I look at them and there's 24 of them in the case of the building permit data. Well, what are they? Are they, are they you know, in this case, there's, there's four different types of variables that we wanna think about. Now each one of them has multiple subtypes, okay? But at a high level, it's really qualitative or quantitative, okay? Is it numerical? And can I uh, map it on a continuous axis? Or is it something I would use to group? And you can, again, flex back and forth between those. But the way to remember the data types is, uh, think about it like wine, okay, like noir. I call it data noir. <laughs> there it is. There's your bottle. So cheers to the data types. But uh, remembering these data types is as easy as just remembering that word noir. So N, nominal. What are those? Those are just named things. Maybe it's gender. Maybe it is, you know, um, the, um, the state you live in. It's something that's named. There's no um, inherent order 
or greater than or less than between nominal uh, data types. They're just different things, okay? Whereas ordinal, again, it's still this light blue color, so it's still a qualitative. It's oftentimes given a number, like what's your score of one to five on a satisfaction survey, but essentially it's just ordered. Now, the thing about an ordered variable, okay, is that they go in a specific order. That's why it's called ordinal. So in that sense, it's super easy to remember. But um, there's not necessarily the same distance between categories. So let's think, for example, of wine ratings. So, you know, for a nominal, you talk about the name of the winery or the type of wine. But for ordinal, maybe you talk about the rating that it gets on a scale of, of zero to five stars. So in that sense, you know, well, what's the difference between a one and a two? Is that the same gap as between a two and a three? Well, maybe, but maybe not. You know, there's nothing really to say. It's sort of about preference, right? So maybe the difference from going from a one to a two isn't quite the same as, you know, on the high end, going from a four to a five where you go to an excellent level, according to someone's opinion, perhaps. So now, again, those categories have orders, but they're not necessarily the same distance apart from each other. That's ordinal. Interval is a fascinating one. It's oftentimes given as temperature because of the fact that now we're talking about a quantitative uh, variable type. So that's why it's a little dark blue there, right? So the last two are quantitative. They're numerical. Not only do they have an order, but the difference between them is the same. Okay, so like if I serve this uh, glass of wine at a temperature of, you know, um, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and then I increase the temperature to 65 or go down to 55, not only have I increased it and decreased it, but I've been de increased and decreased it by the exact same amount. And that amount is meaningful and it's, it's equal, okay, in the case of a plus five or a minus five degree change in serving temperature. But there's no real meaning of like ratio. So let's say I go from 50 degrees to 55 degrees, you'd say, well, that's an increase of 10%. But if I go from 50 to 60, I've increased by 20%. Did I increase the temperature twice as much? No, like that's not really what that means. It's not now like twice as hot, right? So, and that's because zero is problematic. Zero degree, in the sense of it's not an absolute value of nothingness. Zero degrees Fahrenheit doesn't mean nothing anything. It's just an arbitrary scale. So that's the difference between interval and the next one, ratio which is where you can not only do that math differences, deltas, but also multiplying and dividing and getting percent changes. So maybe it's price, right? So this is a, a, a $20 uh, bottle or a $40 bottle. Like that's twice as much, right? Twice as much money you have to pay in order to get it. So fractions are meaningful there. So those are the four data types. So kind of taking a quick glance, and this is easy when you've got, well, a couple dozen or less. You can just look at each one of them and sort of get a sense for what the variable types are. Some of those platforms that I showed you make that easy. Like for example, let me bounce out of PowerPoint again. If we come back over here to this uh, Socrata portal, I can see right in here, you know, if I look at all 24, I can see, you know, kind of what they are and as well as like the type there, right? So this is the permit number is just text, okay? But I can come down here and see, for example, like the number of housing units in the permit is a number, right? And so on and so forth. Maybe the location here is a, a map, a geospatial latitude, longitude type coordinate. So again, you know, kind of taking a sense, a quick, take a quick look and seeing what types of variables are included in here and just getting a feel for the flavor of what's involved in there. So that's types. This next one can be kind of easy. Sometimes it can be tricky. So it's all about, you know, is there one of those, of all those variables that you're talking about here in this data set? Does one of them basically comprise of what we call a unique key? In other words, is this one variable appearing once and only once in the record, and does it uniquely describe an entry? Is one of the variables unique throughout the entire data set, right? So we know there's 124,887 records. Is there one variable that has 124,887 different values, each one different in every single row with no duplicates? Um, in this case, you know, we, we can see that likely is, it's going to be the uh, permit number here, right? And in fact, it is. And so one thing I like to do, so you might say, oh, oftentimes this might be called ID. It might be called unique key. It might be called, you know, it could be called a whole variety of things. But oftentimes for, for databases, you're looking at uh, a specific sort of indicator in there in the naming of the variable that this thing is unique. ID is a really common one. So what I like to do though, is I just double check it if I can. So I'm gonna come over here to Tableau. I've connected to this data set right here. You know, this is the build, building permits data set, okay. And what I like to do is I like to kind of like, just look at the number of records right down here. If you've never looked at Tableau, I have all my number 24 uh, row uh, sort of column headers are all listed here. 
and the dimensions and measures give me a sense of the type as well as a little icon next to it. So I already have, just by opening up the data set in some modern BI tools, I have a sense of that, which is great. But I love to ask myself, okay, I think permit number is the unique key. So is it? Well, I'm going to drag number of records up here to text and see that I've got, there's my number. We've seen it a bunch now. And I'm also going to then hold down option and pull over the permit number to text as well. And then I'm going to, it says, well, what field do you want to drop? I'm going to say, I want a distinct count. So I want Tableau to go in and count every single distinct value in there. And I would expect to see the same number, and I do. So that tells me that, yeah, permit numbers is a unique key here, which is awesome. Okay, so sometimes, though, I might get in trouble on this because um, let, let's, let me throw an example at you that might trick you. You guys know me by now. I like doing that on these webinars. Ask my class. I do this all the time. So if I ask you how many different people have been president of the United States, what would you say? What would you say the numbers? How many people have been president of the United States? And just go ahead and type it in the chat so I can make fun of you. See, <laughs> people are hesitant to say that. Or I've, you, okay, yeah, so I'm seeing the number here, 45. Okay, yeah, 45. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, actually, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. So there's actually only 44 human beings have been president in the United States. So we're going to get to that. So, And that's because I fell into this trap myself when I was writing uh, my book, Communicating Data with Tableau, because I found a little Wikipedia page right here for presidents and, you know, when they um, were uh, accepted into office, as well as I then kind of merged it with a data set that showed when they were born and when they died. And got a sense of, you know, I just kind of wanted to know, like, you know, what that looked like in terms of how old were these presidents and did their lives overlap, perhaps other presidents' terms and such, as well as other periods of history was kind of my interest there. I wanted to kind of get a sense for, you know, like, for example, who was the president that was born after the civil rights era and things like that. Uh, first one being Barack Obama, by the way. But again, I started with this. And, and so then what's interesting is if you take then, again, I merged it up with their eight, with their birth and death eight, uh, dates, right? So then if you take a look at the years, how many years they lived, you get Grover Cleveland being 142 years old. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute. There's no one lived that long. I don't think maybe, maybe that would be a Guinness Book of World Records, right? So does anybody know why Grover Cleveland might have such a high lifespan in the way? And you might say, Ben, maybe you just messed up the formula. No, actually I didn't. It's more in how I built this. And again, think about unique key. Yeah, Joshua, you got it. He was president twice. So, um, and, and you know, we say, well, and, and the terms were not uh, sequential or, you know, consecutive. So you can see, you know, from 1885 to 1889, he was the 22nd president. And then Benjamin Harrison was voted into office. And then Cleveland was voted back in again. So he's both the 22nd as well as the 24th president, which is why there are only 44 people, not 45 presidents, you all get it. So again, that all comes from a mistaken notion that I had when I first looked at this data set, which I think is really common and, you know, super just illustrative of the importance of getting a sense of what the unique key is. Because if you asked me at the beginning, what's the unique key? I would have said, well, the president, you know, their name, the president's name, but it's actually not. So the unique key here is actually the term number over here in the top left corner. Yeah, um, so it was actually, yeah, it was actually Cleveland. So, you know, again, he had, so a row is not a president. You might say, well, yes, it is. It's, it, there it is, George Washington, John Adams. True, but actually the row is actually the presidential term. And that includes, you know, the name of a person, in this case, Grover Cleveland Pierce twice. I think you get it. So that happened to me another time. I was dealing with NFL player data and I was looking at their average, I think it was like age and weight and looking at a bunch of different ways, just understanding. Um, that's just fascinating to look at uh, different distributions of, of variables in a, a football player database, but that's another story. But uh, I was noticing it was, I was getting different values sometimes and I kind of was wondering why. And that's because there are some players with the same name. And again, I was doing the analysis at a name level and I needed to create a common combined field, all right, to kind of bring together the name and the position or the name of the team and combine them together. To kind of show you what I mean by that, I don't have that data set open with me right now, but you know what I would do is I would take the president here, right? And then the number, where's the number? There it is, right? President and number. And I would just take these two, I would highlight them both, and I would say create a combined field. And I don't really need to do it here because number is already unique, but this would then certainly kind of make it a, a secondary unique key that also includes the name of the president combined with their term. You get it. 
All right, so let's move along here. We only have 20 minutes left and we're a little over halfway through. Uh, no, I, I can do math, we are halfway through. Okay, so I gotta hustle. So, um, so that's kind of the, the sense of kind of, you know, understanding the boundaries uh, or sort of the borders. But then another one I really like to take a look at is this idea of boundaries. So to me, this is sort of like, um, if, the, if the border of a line is the contour, is the, the kind of, of an island, for example, like New Zealand, is the, the shoreline, right? So I want to see the shoreline. Well, there's another um, way in which I want to understand the contour of the island, and that would be the topography. So the island has, uh, you know, mountains and it has valleys. And so I want to kind of know where's the high point, where's the low point. So I love doing that. And just for fun, just because it's such a cool platform they've built. I'm going to pop into Google Earth right here in the browser. We'll go on down. If you ever played with this, just do Google Earth. You, you'll be blown away. I can just click on New Zealand. Okay, I'm going to come right on into here. There we go. And then I want to kind of get a sense for, again, just to kind of show sort of what I mean here. I can hold down shift and tilt and then maybe zoom on in here um, to sort of get a sense of these highs and lows, right? I can see some high points. So, so what does that mean in the world of data? What, so what is my high point? What is my low point? Well, to me, it's taking these quantitative variables that I've got and just asking myself what's the max and what's the min. Okay, that's it. And it's an important step. So for example, if we go back to our um, building permit data from Seattle, if I say, well, there was, did you notice there was a date in there called applied date? And that was sort of when someone filled out their application, I presume. Um, so I can ask myself, you know, when's the min, when's the max, right? So I can do that really quickly and easily. And I can see that if I just go out of PowerPoint and just kind of, again, I'm, I have to stop doing this because of time, but We'll get to that one. This is the one, yeah. So I can take applied date, here it is, and I'll drag it over to text with option holding down and say, okay, I wanna see the min, there it is, and it looks like it's April 28th, 1986. Well, that was an interesting day, that was, uh, yeah, not, not too far away from when I moved to the United States. So then I can put it also here in text, there we go, and I can say, okay, what's the max? And you can say, oh, the max, in terms of application dates. So it appears that I have somewhere in the neighborhood of 30, uh, five, 34, 33, um, if I can do math quickly, years worth of permit data. Wow, oh my gosh, is that what I've got? It's certainly what the max and min sort of tell me. But again, I can do the same kind of a thing with each one of these variables and ask myself, what's the high, what's the low? But if I stopped there, I would actually be in trouble. So I, I think once you do max and min boundaries or you know, the, min, the, the edges of each one of these variables, it kind of behooves you to go to the next step and ask yourself, oops, sorry, What's the shape? So this is kind of more looking at the interior now of these variables, the distribution of each one of these variables. You know, what does that look like? How does it, what's the spread like? Well, I love this new product. If you played with it called Tableau Prep, I think there's a few other good tools like this that help you clean data um, and prepare it for analysis. Things like Trifacta, things like OpenRefine. The Tableau product is fabulous and it's been out for about a year now. But what I love, one of the things I love, I almost use it even if I don't think I need to clean data. And that's because what I get in this middle pane right here is this sort of like bird's eye view. So imagine like, you know, James Cook and his crew sailed around the edge, right? Well, nowadays we can get that bird's eye view just like in Google Earth. I can kind of take a drone or an airplane or, you know, just kind of look at the whole thing from the top down. And that's what I'm seeing here. I'm seeing my data from the top down, the whole thing. It's amazing. And I love to do that when I start working with data. Give me the whole view. And so this is this data set, building permits right here in Tableau Prep. And I can see you know, the permit numbers and how many there are. There's my number again. And I can look at each one of these and how many there are and, and also their shapes, right? So if I come to the quantitative ones, I can see right away that you know, most uh, permits don't have anything for housing units in terms of like, that's a null. We're gonna talk more about nulls in just a moment. But if I come to this applied date, I see there's an issue here. And if you see what I mean, like if I look at applied date, I can see, first of all, I have about 14,000 nulls where there's a permit number, but there's nothing in there in terms of when it was applied. We'll come more to that. But my bigger problem is right here. Take a look. What does this say? Well, the entire decade of the 1980s, there was, there's only four values in this data set. And same thing with actually the 90s is 50, 52, 52 rows uh, of, um, of variables here in, in like 20 whole years, okay? So that is interesting. So applied date, yes, I knew the min and the max, 1986 to 2019, but I want to actually go in and do more analysis and look at the shape. And this is what that time looks like. So yeah, the minimum is over here in 86 and the max is over here in 2019, but 
I sure have a whole lot of nothing for about, you know, well, the bulk of those, those that time horizon. And so then knowing the shape helps me understand that, okay, I don't really have a contiguous data. These probably are either errors or I would need to probably pick up the phone, you know, and call the people that create the data set and get to a better understanding of why I might have some of these stragglers over here. So yes, I see, it seems like I have 34, 30, some odd years of data, 33 years of data, but I actually don't. I actually more only have like about a decade worth, okay? So again, looking at that shape helps you catch problems like this, that the min and the max values themselves don't tell you. So that's an important thing to do, is understand the shape. Levels um, take us from the quantitative world, right? Looking at maxes and mins of quantitative variables. Levels is telling us the different uh, values of our qualitative variables, the ones that are nominal or ordinal, remember? The light blue ones. So what are the different levels of those? So for example, again, in Tableau Prep, I can see these uh, ABC, right? These are strings, these are qualitative variables, and I can see all of, not only the levels, I love it, how amazing is that? You can see every one of the values for permit class, for example, commercial, industrial, institutional, multifamily, NA, single family, duplex, and vacant land. But I can see also that the bulk of them are the, the largest single category is single family duplex. Because so I get these bar charts behind the names themselves to give me, again, that sense of how many of these, not just what the different levels are, but then again, you know, how many of, of each one of them are present in the data set. It's super awesome. But I can say, for example, that if I go to permit type map, this is important because, you know, I might find, and this is the permit class, which is great, but I might find that, you know, I was doing some, making a bunch of statements to people, perhaps, about this data set, about building Seattle. Remember I talked about the cranes and building and construction, but a lot of these are actually demolitions. So and actually it's like the, you know, fourth or fifth, fifth largest category is demo. So those are times when something's being taken out before perhaps something's being built or maybe nothing's being built. Uh, after the demo is done. So, or maybe it's just someone demoing their fence, you know, getting rid of uh, something like that. So again, you know, if I was talking about every one of these variables in the context of building things, then I might be a little bit off and I might not know that unless I take a look at these different qualitative variables and see the levels and see which ones are there. Oh, this includes demolition as well. Okay, now if I'm going to talk about this data set, I'll know that that's part of it. Hope that makes sense. So then, you know, kind of knowing what those levels are keys you into some different moments like that where you say, oh, that isn't quite what I thought I was looking at when I first looked at this 124,000 record database. All right, so that's levels. Hierarchies is something that happens oftentimes, right? So hierarchies, this is essentially qualitative variables that, have, that are grouped. So you may be talking about in a business, you've got the corporation with business units, and in the business unit, you have departments, and in the department, you have teams. Okay, so this is hierarchy now. Also, in like, you know, this world of sports, you might have a sports league, but then within the league of conferences, then you have divisions. And so, you know, that's a hierarchy as well. So it, it is good to know of all of those qualitative variables I've got, right? Which ones of them, like, for example, if I think about the population of the earth, right? So if we break the earth down, we could break it down to a whole bunch of different ways. But one of the ways we could break it down is like continents or regions and then countries. And if I do that, as the World Bank does, you can see they've got regions and then each one of those regions has countries that are importantly, you know, in one and only one of these regions, by the way. So that's an important aspect to think about as well. Um, so, you know, I might be able to say, okay, well, if I was going to do analysis on this World Bank data about the population and I wanted to ask, ask and answer questions about North America, it would help me know that there are three different countries there that are included, Bermuda, Canada, and the U.S. are included because they've put uh, Mexico, for example, over here in Latin America, the way that they have, uh, this isn't my categorization, it's theirs. But in any case, it's helpful for me to go, okay, well, I'm not gonna start doing a bunch of analysis on North America unless I get a sense of how it's broken down and if there's a hierarchy, what's included, what's not included. A key question to ask about some, but not all qualitative variables, as I think you can understand. Last but not least, and then I left even a few minutes for questions and comments and whatnot, which is so rare for me, but I've kind of been talking fast, so I knew I had a lot of ground to cover, but nose is really important, you know, and it's funny, I had an interesting conversation on LinkedIn recently with a, with a person who said, you know, really, is that all this is about? Just kind of knowing how many nulls are in files, that's what we need to do to help people become more data literate. And I think that it's a fascinating uh, conversation because... You know, you really only, we've already gotten to the place here where we're dealing with a data set that is interesting to us about the world we live in, 
And we've already gotten to the place where we've asked a worthwhile question about the world we live in. And we're appreciating the fact that data here is just a lens to see our world. So is this a technical nuance and detail? Yeah, absolutely it is. Sometimes data sets have nulls. Um, but it can be an important one. And I feel like it's not only important to appreciate the value of data and what it does for us and how we can use it and make use of it and, and approach it, but also then, you, you, you know, kind of getting into the nitty gritty of figuring out some of these technical details and nuances can be interesting. Um, I'm seeing a question come through here. Other examples of interval data other than temperature. Such a great question. I had that exact same question. I actually Googled it yesterday because anytime you look at interval data, everybody just talks about Fahrenheit or Celsius. So there are a few others, like, for example, like um, uh, think about anything you have a measurement of that doesn't really have a meaningful zero, like maybe IQ, the IQ score, you know, or if, in the in case of wine, it was sort of interesting because the wine score, there's a way of scoring wine. I actually just tweeted about it yesterday. It's like on a zero to 100 scale, but like the lowest rating you can get is 50. So, and, and actually nobody ever does. It's more like 80 to 100. So yes, there is a score. Yes, it's a number. Yes, there's differences between these, but there's not a real big meaningful like percentage change. So in other words, like a wine that's scored at 80 and it goes to 85 has a certain percent change in that number, right? But it, because if I go to 85 to 90, it, I can't really compare like the percent increase. Yeah, no problem. Uh, but yeah, it's anytime you, so that's the key thing is I need to think about times where zero isn't really meaningful. So like IQ of zero, like does that mean no intelligence? Does it mean brain dead, right? Like, so no. So that's kind of a, a good thing. But let's finish off with nulls here. Good question, Lauren. Thanks for, for jumping in. I had the same question myself because if you Google interval data, that's all you see online, unless you Google what are other examples other than temperature. All right, so nulls, right? So nulls, if I, you know, we talked about this, right? So if I said, well, I want to take a look at these presidents and understand their lifespan, okay? So I want to know, when they were born, when they died, and, and how many years or, or days or what have you, you know, they were alive. Well, if I do that with my data, I find pretty quickly that if I scroll to the bottom, so I can see, let me just bounce out of, of PowerPoint. I'll go back into my president data set. Is this it right? Here we go. Okay. So, you know, I could take these presidents here, okay, and I could take, um, for example, I have their, their lifespan now, including null. Uh, actually, no, I won't include null at first. I'll just look at their lifespan right here. I don't think this one includes null, does it? I, yeah, see, it doesn't. So there's some presidents in here, you know, seem like they have no lifespan. <laughs> so Barack Obama, Donald Trump, George W. Bush, Jimmy Carter. So what do they have in common, right? So they, what they have in common is they have a null value in the um, field for dying. Okay? So it's because they haven't died yet, they're still alive, they're still living. So I can deal with that by incorporating into, instead of doing a simple lifespan, calculation. In this case, you know, all it does is just say, what's the difference in years between born and died? Okay, so if a certain president has nothing and died, and by the way, I still have the problem with Grover Cleveland, so <laughs> let me just fix that by putting number here first. All right, there we go. So again, you know, I go to the bottom here, I get these blanks. All right, so instead of looking at lifespan like that, where all I'm doing is just looking at born and died and comparing those two dates, I can incorporate appreciation of the fact that some of them might be null. So I might say, look, if the value in the row or record is of died is null, then I'm going to look at the difference between the day they were born and today. Okay, and then if uh, the, otherwise, if that val if there is a value in died, I'm going to take a look at the difference in days between when they were born and when they died. Right. So this is sort of now a scenario where if I put this in here, okay. Uh, this calculation, I can see I've got these ones in here. Now, it's a little misleading. You might say, oh my gosh, it looks like you know, their lifespan is over, and we know it's not. So I have to do an additional field here right? that says, well, hey, if I want to create a new qualitative field that says, if the value for died is null, then I'm going to say that that president is still living. I'm going to make a, ca a qualitative a new variable, nominal variable, right? Nominal. Noir and nominal, so living. And then if it's not null, then I will have that be deceased. And then I can use this put it out under color, which helps me because now I can see, oh, okay, you know, I'm looking at ones here that are still living. So again, you know, that's a way of dealing with nulls. Now, nulls can be tricky because sometimes they're not actually, in this case, it was pretty straightforward. It was a true null in the sense of what I look at is if I look in the spreadsheet, I see nulls in here, right? So I go to that column for die, column G, and those presidents, you have nothing there. 
Okay. So, but then um, oftentimes, like for example, with the, I'm um, just catching up on comments here. Number of people in a queue is often treated as ordinal. Yeah, then it's fuzzy. Ordinal and interval, uh, interval can, be, can be fuzzy there. So it's a great discussion. It isn't always super clear exactly which type it goes into. That's maybe a conversation for another day. Even quantitative variables can be bucketed in bins, like in histograms, and be grouped in values. So, you know, again, there's some, there's some gray area there when we talk about the variable type. Back to Nulls, though. Um, and thanks for the comments and, and all that. I really appreciate it. But uh, yeah, thank you, Brad. You just keyed on it, right? Placeholders for null. So th in this case, it is a true null. There's nothing there. There's no zero. There's no nothing. But in that, remember I talked about that example. Sorry, let me get caught up with, of, of snow in Seattle, okay? I got the National Weather Service data. Now, did you look real closely? Because I did. I didn't notice that. There's some weird numbers in here, like there's M and there's T. I didn't know what they were. I, I, I was guessing that M maybe meant missing. I had no idea what T meant. You know, I can see some zeros in here. So I went back and forth with the amazing people at NOAA. I just sent them an email. These people must have been slammed in the last few weeks dealing with all the snow and predictions and projections. And I had like four people email me back about the same single question, like within an hour. It was amazing. I couldn't believe it. Never had that kind of response before. But um, four different people told me that M means missing, okay? And T means trace, means less than 0.1 inches of snow. In other words, it's a dust cover. And you can't even really, it's like a trace amount. And so then, you know, that was good. That's essentially the, then I said, well, hey, how does that, what's the difference between M and zero? Well, they said, well, zero, we know in that month we took measurements every day and there was zero inches of snow every single day. And so we know that there was at CTAC in this case, right? Zero inches of snow in that entire month, the number zero, it's a known number. But if there was ever a case where there was something missing, they didn't take the, a reading or perhaps there could be a variety of uh, causes for them to not have a reading that would lead them to say, you know, the data for that month is missing. And it's interesting because there's actually, I don't think I have it with me here now, but there's actually data missing for, uh, for, for eight straight years from 1996 to 2004. It's all missing. They, they did not take records of snowfall depth at SeaTac for that eight year period of time. I was going to find out why. And, and so I didn't really get a chance to yet, but I'm curious to know what was the reason for them, you know, maybe making a process change or a procedure change or who knows, perhaps there was some equipment issue. I'm just guessing. But I know for a fact now I can get a quick answer from NOAA because they're amazing. But in, in any case, we have to be careful with that. And I asked them the next question, which is, well, how do you calculate T for trace? It's less than 0.1 inches. How do you compute that with averages and things like that? And they said, well, we treat it as if it were zero. So that was helpful for me when I did the analysis of snowfall data, which we'll talk about more later. But I, just, I put a zero in there, okay, even though – actually, I put a null in there, sorry, because I didn't want to count it. Traces, I put a zero. Traces, I, I substituted trace with zero, and I substituted with a null value, nothing there, okay? So again, that's helpful when you compute averages. That's really important to know. Okay, so that's nulls. They're tricky. It's good to know about them. And if you think about it, that whole gap to return us back to the whole point where which we started in New Zealand and the map of New Zealand, that little gap between North, the North and South Islands in New Zealand, that's a null, isn't it, right? So they thought there was a shoreline there. Turns out it's a null. There's no shoreline there. So uh, they missed it. They missed that null and they assumed there was something there when there wasn't. So there we have it. Those are 10 simple questions. Yeah, Brad, you teed me off perfectly right there. That's the exact thing I was going to get to. So thank you for bringing it up. But yeah, the idea that nulls aren't necessarily always literally blank, but can be, can be the word blank, can be all kinds of things really. But it takes a little bit of assessment of are there uh, interesting values in there, like for a T, for an inch data, that, that's immediately something that would cause me to be interested in what that means. Turns out that's not a null, but but M certainly is. But those are the 10 questions that I have right now. They're close to analysis, aren't they? You know, they involve using tools. They involve scanning it. To me, it's a little bit not quite into the full analysis phase. I'm not really looking at relationships. I think the act of looking, if there's one that's close, it's shape, because that's actually taking a look at distributions and understanding variations and things of that nature. But this to me is sort of like a quick gut check for when I first come across a data set I've never, ever seen before. And I like to sort of do a quick little, um, uh, I guess, inventory, you know, of these sort of questions here of this data set. So that's what I got. That's how I like to explore the contours of a data set. I think it's really important to do. I think it's important to bake it into our thought process, even if it's not like some mechanical checkbox. Maybe at the beginning it is, you know, just like anything as we build skills. Sometimes we're very purposeful and deliberate about doing those steps very consciously and almost clumsily, but it's like a forced thing. And then eventually, we're fluent enough that this is just a part and parcel to how we think about getting our hands on data and working with it. 
in a way that these sort of questions are naturally part of how we engage with the data set. So I'd like to know if you all have any questions for me. I ended with just a few minutes left here, but uh, what, what are some thoughts you have about, and not just questions, but comments, or do you think there's an 11th question to ask? Um, and or like, you know, do, are there anything, is there anything you'd like to know about this topic at all? And I gotta make sure I look at both chat and Q&A. I'll follow up. And while you're maybe typing in a question here or there, I'm going to send out the notes here, including this little one pager. So you got it to either print out or send it to someone that you know. I know so many people that are just starting to get into the process of working with data. And so I thought this would be a little helpful for them to kind of think it through. Okay, a question, uh, uh, comment here from Catherine. I think tying back to your exploration to the business case is important. Great point. So, you know, why are we doing this in the first place? And so, you know, that's sort of this entire sort of overall flow Sorry for zooming back, but we've come to a scenario here where you know we are exploring the contours of, of, of the data set, right? But yes, we've already based that, and the only reason we're here is because we have an interesting question. And I think that in order for us to really get value here, it's going to be scenarios where, um, to Catherine's point, we have asked ourselves a worthwhile question. And that worthwhile, or sometimes meaningful as other people would put it, it's got to be tied to a business case in the context of business data. In personal data, maybe it's a health, uh, fitness, or personal well-being. In the context of public data, could this be like a community um, kind of initiative or something like that? So like, what's the thing we're looking at? Why does it matter? Why do we care? Um, so yeah, that is important. And again, that gets back to that conversation I mentioned on LinkedIn where this isn't a technical exercise to take some random data set and just go through these 10 questions like a robot. No, it's about really, again, the data is the lens. What we care about is not the lens. What we care about is the world. And, um, and yeah, that's a really important thing to think about as it relates to sort of why we're doing this in the first place, okay? Thank you all uh, for joining. I hope this was helpful. I'll send out the link here after I get it uploaded and all that and, and a little bit uh, modified. But, but um, again, thanks for joining. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, look for the next webinar. It's going to be coming again in a couple weeks. I'll go back to uh, Wednesdays. I'm actually flying out of town tomorrow, so that's why it's on a Tuesday, so look for it. Uh, Michael Mixon, thank you for joining. Again, thank you for the phrase that really changed the way I work with data over the last few years, and i um, hopeful that I can help spread that. I think this is a good way to avoid some pitfalls and things. Um, question from Doug, are you going to consider creating a Patreon account? Oh, <laughs> well, thank you for the suggestion. Uh, maybe I should. I don't know. Um, yeah, these for me right now, I'm, I'm just getting started with this business, and, and a lot of it for me is a core thing I want to do is put free resources out there that are just super helpful to people. It's a tenet of my business strategy is to, and my whole mission is to raise all uh, you know levels here. Um, so, but maybe I'll consider doing that at some point down the road. So thanks for the suggestion there. Thank you, Catherine, for the comment there. Um, and Brad, again, appreciate your, your uh, perfectly timed <laughs> comment early on about nulls. Um, data profiling, I like that phrase. It ties into what we call, this is Brad Kenny's conversation. Uh, comment really ties into what we call data profiling here. Yeah, it's metadata. It's it's sort of early phases of analysis, probably a few different ways to think about it. And um, yeah, that's helpful. I like that phrase to profiling. You kind of get like a kind of a scan real quick of, of what's this the overall. Okay, so thanks for the comments and questions, everyone. It's always nice to have that interaction. Appreciate it. I'm going to wrap it up now. So look for the next one. And until then, um, you know, good luck with all the data working you do spreading this uh, idea that everyone, you know, of, of every background and education level is uh, someone who can be working on their level of data literacy. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.